everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. In this series we're going to begin the restoration of the Commodore 128. Now seeing as it's not as well known as the Commodore 64, I thought it's worth doing a little introduction to it. Released in 1985, the Commodore 128 is the last of Commodore's 8-bit computer line. Led by Bill Hurd, the design team created a 3-in-1 computer that not only ran its Commodore 128 mode, it was also fully backwards compatible with the hugely popular Commodore 64, and it had the capability to run CPM, a well-established multi-platform operating system mainly used with business software. Think like spreadsheets, word processing, databases, that kind of thing. Sporting not only one but two CPUs, a Z80 for the CPM compatibility and a variant of the 6510 from the Commodore 64, both of these were capable of running at 2 MHz. It had two video chips, the VIC-2E, again a variant of the VIC-2 used in the C64, and the VDC for the 80 column display mode. It also sported 128 kilobits of RAM and basic version 7 for the 128 mode, but although being a far more capable machine than the 64, it actually sold less units and had a shorter production life. Okay, so the 128 seems like a pretty sweet machine, but we need to look at why it didn't blitz the competition and outsell the C64. Um, so let's start by looking at the CPM mode. So the CPM mode can run at 2 MHz, which is the maximum speed for the 128 and also for the Z80, which it uses. Um, there is 128K available in that mode. Display, generally you're gonna need the 80 column RGBI compatible monitor or CGA. Um, so you can't really use it with a TV. I think it is capable of 40 column mode, but um, most software for CPM is written with 80 column display in mind. Uh, the disk drive, in order to be compatible with other CPM formatted disks, you needed either the 1571 or the 1581 disk drive, which um, both costs a lot more than the, the standard 1541 that was available for the Commodore 64. Uh, in terms of software, CPM was pretty much dead by 1985, so um, software was definitely going down quite quickly by that time. And in terms of cost, yeah, CPM machines were becoming pretty cheap because, yeah, it wasn't being used. So in terms of cost for a CPM computer, the Commodore was quite expensive. So yeah, not a good look for CPM mode. Let's look at C128 mode. So in C128 mode, you could either have 1 megahertz when using a TV. This is because the VIC-2 chip can only run at 1 megahertz. So in order to take advantage of the 2 megahertz mode in 128 mode, you actually needed, once again, an RGBI monitor. Um, and that meant you were limited to using the 80 column display mode. And the chip, the VDC chip for the 128, didn't support hardware sprites. So it wasn't useful for gaming at all, really. So you pretty much, most of the time, were limited to 1 megahertz and then of course using that on a TV. Um, either way you had 128K available, which was good. Disk drive, well, you could have anything. The 1541 um, could work, but that was quite slow. And yeah, obviously it supported the 1571 and the 1581, which were fast, um, but not compatible in the C64 mode, which we'll get to in a sec. Software, well, it started off slow and continued to be slow because it just wasn't really adopted for anything outside of maybe Geos in 128 mode, which was, you know, definitely a step up from Geos in 64 mode. But apart from that, nothing special. Uh, in terms of cost, yeah, again, the 128 would be um, pretty costly compared to the 64, which was also on sale for half the price at the time. And actually the, the 128 went from, I think 1985 to, I think it stopped selling in 89, whereas the 64 was available from 1892, 1982 uh, up to, I think they stopped it in 92, 93 ish. So um, yeah, the 64 outlived the 128 and usually was sort of half the price of the 128 during those years. 
You know, obviously 64 mode has to run at one megahertz. You've only got 64K available. And display, you can use any old TV. Disk drive, mainly the 1541, which yeah, was slow but cheap. It could work with the 1571, but it couldn't take advantage of the burst mode or anything like that. So it was still slow in 1571 mode anyway. And software, well, yeah, seeing it had already been out for a few years, software was just increasing at a, at a crazy rate compared to the 128 software, which was pretty much dead on arrival. All right, so here it is. This is the Commodore 128 that was generously donated to me by Mr. Lurch. It is apparently working, um, but it does need some love and care. Um, it is quite yellow. It looks like there was a label stuck here, so we can sort of get an idea from that what the original color is supposed to look like. And there's also, it also has engraved Southern Cross Primary School number six, which uh, is a local primary school. I don't think I'm going to worry too much about that. It sort of gives it a bit of character and history. So, um, but I will retro bright this and um, I do have these keys on the way. So um, yeah, that will definitely come in handy to replace those. Uh, I found them, if you're wondering, uh, on Etsy from a seller called, I think it's Amiga Scene. Uh, so if you're looking for C128 keys, check that out. I'll put a link down below if I remember. And um, yeah, this is the power supply. Now, something you'll probably notice is it doesn't look the same as most Commodore 128 power supplies. The majority of the 128 power supplies more resemble the Amiga power supplies, which are a, a pretty solid switch mode power supply. But our one here looks a lot more like one of the Commodore 64 power supplies, which is the often referred to as the Brig of Death because it's a linear power supply. And when the voltage regulator craps itself, it usually goes short circuit and sends full voltage into the Commodore 64, which ends up killing some chips. So first of all, let's just get this out of the way for a second. We'll just have a peek inside this power supply, but yeah, like I said, I think it is looking like it's a linear one, um, which is not good. Um, and even though the 128 uses the same DIN connector as the Amigas, they're not actually compatible. Um, the Amiga has different voltages available. So you can't use an Amiga power supply on your Commodore 64 and vice versa, otherwise you will kill one of them. All right, let's have a look. Yeah, okay, so it's pretty dusty, but yeah, this this is definitely a linear power supply. Look, it, it looks like a just a beefed up version of the Commodore 64, which makes sense because uh, it's rated at 4.3 amps on the five volt rail, so Commodore 64 is usually 1.5 to 1.7 amps. It's not a big deal. It, it does currently work. I have tested the voltages out of it, but I think I will look at trying to squeeze in a switch mode power supply in this space, but um, I don't have anything at the moment. So that'll be a future project, but it seems reliable enough at the moment. So. I'm not too concerned about using it for the time being. The 128. Now the case screws are already uh, missing from this, so it should just pop open. Here we go. So this is it. Um, there were a couple of heat shields that Mr. Lurch also gave to me, but I've already chucked them out because they were all rusted. So. Uh, not worth keeping them around they don't really do anything apart from trap heat and I've just noticed that I left this out so that normally sits on there in that little can and it's got little tabs that act as heat sinks the original shield that goes over the top also has little tabs that act as heat sinks for some of the um, the major chips but um, we're gonna put little heat sinks on top of each one anyway while we're here, let's go for a quick tour of the board. So we've got our user port up here, which is the same as Commodore 128. This is the RGBI output uh, for the 80 column display mode. 
RF modulator, avoid this at all costs because it's crap. Um, the regular video out, which is pretty much the same as the C64, also the serial port, same again, cassette port and cartridge slash expansion port. So ports are all pretty much the same apart from the VDC 80 column output. It does have a reset button, which the Commodore 64 doesn't have, so that's always a nice inclusion. Apart from that, everything is pretty much the same. Obviously, the power connect is different, but still two joystick ports, DB9 joystick ports. Looking around the rest of the board, um, there's a 6526 CIA here, and another one over in this corner. So same as the Commodore 64, two of those. There is this empty socket at U36. Now this is empty from the factory. Uh, it's actually designed to um, to handle a function ROM. So you can have a um, an IC in there that'll that'll boot into say GEOS. I think you still have to have the the system disk, but that's what that's for. A lot of people also use it for. I think it's called the Sentinel ROM, which um, I will have a look at in the future when I start burning some chips. Uh, next to that we've got, I believe, half of the version 7 of BASIC and this is the other half, so it's split over two chips because it is quite bigger than version 2 of the BASIC which looks to be this guy here. This is the VDC chip which handles the 80 column display and there's a couple of um, supporting RAM chips for it. And over here we've got the VIC-2E which is a variant of the VIC-2 uh, with a few extra pins that actually are there to handle the um, the extra keys from the from the 128 keyboard because um, the CIA chips are still the same and they're already taken up basically so it's got a couple of extra inputs just to to process those SID chip this is a 6581R3 uh, I think the 128D which is the desktop sort of version in the case has the 8580 SID chip because this particular one came out before the um, the D. Although the, I think the D was always planned as coming out, that, hence why there's little gaps here for these posts. Because um, in the D case, you need these little holes for the main board to fit in. Anyway, over here is a memory mapper, which I think handles 64 or 128K of RAM. Speaking of which, these are our two banks of 64K, so only one bank is used in Commodore 64 mode, and obviously you've got both banks in 128 mode. Some logic, I believe this is the character ROM. I don't remember what that one is, to be perfectly honest. This looks like a combined PLA and possibly some logic as well, but a lot more reliable than the original PLAs found in the C64, so we shouldn't have any issues with that. A bit more logic. There's the 8502 chip, which um, yeah, is the variant of the 6510, but this one runs at 2 megahertz. And then we've got the Sharp Z80 uh, CPU for um, CPM compatibility. This also needs to be functioning in order for everything else to function because this actually gets addressed on boot and controls which mode the 128 boots into. So the Z80 does have to be functioning regardless of if you're using CPM mode or not. That's about it. Let's have a look at what needs to be done. Obviously, um, I do like to recap these things and there's not too many electrolytic caps, so that's pretty easy. The video output from this connector is quite terrible. Uh, unfortunately, video output doesn't come directly from the VIC-2 chip. It actually runs through the RF modulator. So pretty much in order to fix the video output, we need to fix whatever the hell's going on with this. And it is, there's quite a bit of rust around here and quite a lot of rust around this can. So this will have to come out and get cleaned up. Um, apart from that, there's yeah, a bit of rust around the edge of the board, but nothing too major. And of course, like I said, the um, the whole case is going to get a clean up and a retro bright. The bottom looks still fairly white, but the top is definitely yellowed quite a lot. And um, yeah, we'll replace these keys, so I'll probably pull the whole keyboard out and just give it a full clean. But um, for now, let's get straight into some of this this rust. So 
you pull the board out, I assume it's still, yeah, there's no screws holding that in. All right, so let's try and get this nasty looking can out. It's, it's rusted all along the edge. It's probably a bastard to get out to. Oh yeah, if you're wondering, most of these bodge wires are likely to be from factory. Um, yeah, they're sort of last minute fixes that, that Commodore did. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much about them. Right, so I'm just gonna add some fresh solder just to get things flowing. It should make it easier when it comes to desoldering this stuff. Managed to remove one of the eyelets. Luckily that's not going to be a big deal. Right, I think we're free. Yuck. That's pretty nasty. Yeah. I don't think I'll actually put this back in. Um, but we'll see how it cleans up. If I can get it fairly clean without too much effort, I'll put it back in, but if not, we'll just clean up around the board here. Um, usually while we're at it and everything's warmed up, let's get the, the modulator out too, because it's gonna need some cleaning up. Hopefully we can safely remove this now. Ooh. That's that's just horrid. <laughs> okay, now that I've finished throwing up, let's um, open this up and have a closer look. If it will open. Rusty chat. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of rust and crap going on inside. Let's see if we can get the bottom off. Oh yeah, that's nasty. <laughs> um, well, definitely some cleanup work to do. Not sure if I'm gonna bother with this. I guess I'll clean it up and see what it looks like. Otherwise we'll just heat sink these. Um, I guess it also depends if I manage to get this cleaned up. Otherwise there'll be nothing attach to the top of the can too anyway so um let us start the cleanings we'll start with the board first so strap. right so I've taken off some of the the loose stuff but we're gonna have to get in there a little bit tighter to get to the rest and find some vinegar okay Vinegar shot, anyone? No? Didn't think so. Right, so just a progress shot of where we're up to. Um, most of it came up pretty well. Um, the board's just covered in IPA at the moment, um, just because I went around and cleaned up a couple of other suspect areas that um, 
could have eventually harbored some more rust um, but all in all it looks a lot better especially around where this can was and the RF modulator the RF modulator itself did come up a little bit better it's currently also got IPA all over it because everything got a bit of a vinegar bath um, the can from the modulator still isn't perfect this thing I just went at it with a wire brush because yeah there was just no really easy way of getting that crap off so if I do end up reinstalling it um, these things will get a clear coat just to stop them from re-rusting what I probably should do before I go any further is just put the RF modulator back in just to make sure I haven't killed this in some silly way uh, hopefully not but I um, also want to get a picture of um, what the video output looks like from the RF modulator before we move forward just so we can get a good comparison later on when we try and clean up the video output all right, so this is what the current video output looks like with composite and as you can see my capture device doesn't even want to sync it properly it's it's probably that rough that it doesn't know what to do with it uh, so let's look at the s video one um, which actually syncs properly and yeah as you can see the picture is quite rubbish there's a lot of jail bars and uh, a bit of ghosting as well so that's with the unmodified rf modulator Let's just recap it and see if that makes it any better. I'm not going to hold my breath with this thing because, yeah, it's pretty nasty. So it may have made the tiniest bit of difference. Um, the composite still doesn't want to sync properly, um, but you can definitely see on the S video, there is less ghosting on the image. The jail bars are still incredibly prominent. So that's, uh, that's about all we're going to get out of that at the moment. Should we go ahead and replace the whole thing? Okay, so somewhere around here I've got the Super Video board, which um, is basically a replacement for the, the modulator in the 128 and also in the, um, the 250469 boards in the Commodore 64s, but I cannot find it, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so good news, I found the Super Video Board. So this is an RF modulator replacement uh, that it pretty much only outputs S-Video and audio via a 3.5mm audio jack. It does also contain some of the functions of the LumaFix board. Um, so there's a couple of little pots that we can adjust. And there's also some jumpers here that actually don't know exactly what they do and the instructions are in German and even with my very basic knowledge of German it doesn't look like it actually goes over what these uh, jumpers do so um doesn't matter let's put it together and I guess we'll find out that way um, so it does require a tiny bit of soldering get it set up basically you've just got to solder the pins okay so the super video board is in place let's um give it a test hmm. that's not going to work anymore need an s video cable Okay, so I've hooked up the Super Video Board, I've had a bit of a play around with it. Um, yeah, as I suspected, the manual does not mention what these jumpers do, uh, but I'll probably have to pull this back out again, so I'll have a look at what they're connected to. I get the feeling they might have to, something to do with the audio jack, possibly to support dual SIDs, or maybe it's to, um, to ground the audio input on the SID chip, I'm not sure. The other thing is I did test this out without the, um, the AEC input, which is on the top of the board here. I tested it out without that hooked up and in which case the AEC pot doesn't do anything when you adjust it. But then I hooked that up to the, the AEC of the VIC-2, or the VIC-2E in this case. The manual does mention that it's pin 16 of the VIC-2, 
which is correct for a Commodore 64, but in the C128, it's actually pin 12 on the VIC-2E, that's the AEC line. So I hooked that up and that does allow us to adjust this pot, but in all honesty, I adjusted it all the way in because um, that was where the image was improving, uh, but then I got to the end of how far it would go. So even with it adjusted all one way, it still looks the same as if I didn't have the, the AEC wire connected. So, um, well, that was worth a try. Um, either way, this thing still puts out a much better video signal than the original RF modulator. Um, but yeah, maybe we can try some other options in the future. So we'll move away from the video signal stuff and Obviously, I'll get this board recapped, which is fairly boring, so we might skip over that. And then we'll move on to the keyboard and the case. Um, but I think, I'm guessing this video is getting pretty long in the tooth by now. So we'll split that up into next time and take it from there. So as always, thanks for watching the Retro channel. Please be sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, you can leave me a like, dislike, uh, leave me a comment, share it around. And I will catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Bye. Okay, so I'll just give you a quick look at this super video board. So these jumpers are connected to the audio jack. So when they're both enabled like this, basically it's sending our mono audio signal to the left and right side of the 3.5 mil stereo audio jack. Um, but funnily enough, the last jumper actually isn't connected to anything at all. I've poked around the board and it, it doesn't seem to be connected at all. So I'm not even sure why it's there. Maybe it was a feature in a previous revision. This one says revision B. So ideally, most of the time you're going to have those two jumpers installed as it is. So um, that's it. That's the Super Video Board.